Thank you for joining me on talking about the book of Revelation. At Stillwater's Church, we're in this series um, called The Lamb, the Lion, and the Warrior King, and we're going through the book of Revelation. Well, there's no way that in 13 weeks I can talk about everything in the book of Revelation that would take probably a year or more if I preached everything that's in the book. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing some supplemental videos uh, that you can watch that will talk about a small piece of the book of Revelation or some of the things that are taught in the book of Revelation. So today I'm going to talk to you about the second coming of Christ and the rapture. I'm going to explain that to you. So maybe if you have questions about this, these will answer your questions. Well, the second coming of Christ or the return of Christ, whatever you want to call it, is when Jesus returns to earth in bodily form to complete his work of salvation and redemption and to judge the living and the dead. That is what the second coming of Christ means. Jesus is going to come. It's a real return. It's a bodily return because we know that Jesus became human and he resurrected and has a, a resurrected body and he is literally going to come again. It's not metaphor. It, it's not spiritual uh, in its essence. It is a literal, real return when Jesus comes again. And this is a central tenet of Christian doctrine. It is a belief that is taught throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me read to you something from the Apostles' Creed and show you how that this has been a central belief uh, of the church from the very beginning. We believe in Christian doctrine that Jesus Christ is coming again. So here's what it says about Jesus in the Apostles' Creed. It says that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades or into the earth or into the grave. And the third day he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. So it's uh, in the Apostles' Creed, it's in the New Testament, it's even in the Old Testament. So the doctrine of the second coming of Christ is essential to Christian belief and to the completion of Jesus' work of salvation for all believers. Now, Jesus told us himself that he would come again. Listen to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Some translations read rooms. Some translations read mansions. But this was based on the Jewish tradition of the father's house and all the family even adding on rooms so that there was room for everybody in the father's house. And so he said, if this were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's his promise. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus himself said that he was coming again. And then in Matthew 24, 27, Jesus said, As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, whenever Jesus referred to the Son of Man, that is a designation from the book of Daniel and from other places in the Old Testament that referred to the Messiah. He was called the Son of Man. And so when Jesus said that he was the Son of Man, he was saying, I'm the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I'm the Savior of the world. So when he described this, he was saying that he was going to come again. So he was literally going to come back. And this doctrine is established throughout the New, the, the New Testament, okay? Not just from the Gospels, but also uh, in the letters that were written to the churches. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verses 13 to 17. This is a very famous passage of Scripture dealing with the the rapture and the return of Christ. It says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. This is comforting because believers who have died, we don't have to grieve like others because we know that we'll see them again. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And so Jesus has established that he's coming again. He's coming in in visible bodily form, and he is going to rule and reign on the earth, and he's going to bring judgment against evil, evil governments, uh, false religion, and sin, and the devil himself. Then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, it says, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him, listen, by the splendor of his coming. So Jesus is going to come again. Now, there are two different views. Actually, there are three uh, or four prevalent views about the second coming of Christ. We use the word rapture. That's actually not a word that's in the Bible. But the word rapture is uh, when Jesus comes and there's a, a, a capturing away of believers. And It is described in in a passage that we just read there. And let me tell you what um, this was based on. When the New Testament was written, it was very common for when a king came to a city that a delegation of people would go out to meet him and then at the same time come back into the city with him. So it was really a welcome. It was a delegation that celebrated the coming of the king. And so in this sense, uh, it seems that uh, what is described as the rapture, even though that isn't used in the Bible, that word, uh, what is described here seems to indicate that the rapture and the second coming will be at the same time. Now, there certainly are many that don't believe that. There are many that believe that the rapture and the second coming are two events that are separated by the tribulation period. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, But if these delegations and the illustration that that was used here is what they were talking about, then the rapture is that capturing the, the, the believers, those that are dead, uh, becoming uh, alive again in a resurrected body, those of us, if we are still alive, uh, that our body will be changed and we will have a resurrected body as well and we'll meet the Lord in the air as he is coming again. Now, let me describe to you four prevalent views on the rapture, okay? Um, the first view is what I would call the pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, it's before the tribulation that is described in the book of Revelation. And this thought is that Christ will come for believers before the tribulation and will come with believers at the second coming. Now, this thinking is that there are two distinct events separated by the tribulation. So that's called a pre-tribulation rapture or pre-tribulation view. The second view is a mid-tribulation view on the rapture, which, of course, you can figure that out. That means it would happen in the middle of the tribulation. And that is the view that the seven years of tribulation in uh, the interpretation of of the book of Revelation 
that those seven years are actually literally seven years that the church doesn't go through, that God spares them. Uh, the mid-tribulation view is that the church goes through the first three and a half years, and the last three and a half years, they're raptured out, and they don't go through that judgment um, or that, that difficult time, that period of tribulation. And so that's the pre-tribulation view, and both of those views believe that the tribulation is a literal period that a completely defined period it's not necessarily a, a, a metaphorical not metaphor necessarily but like a a type of um, uh, illustration of a period of time not necessarily seven years but maybe uh, it alludes to a, a specific time uh, and then there is uh, the post-tribulation rapture, and this view believes that uh, believers will be raptured at the second coming of Christ, and are part of this. That that is part of the same event. That the rapture and the second coming, they're part of the same event. This view sees First Thessalonians four sixteen and seventeen. Uh, we just read that. That it's like a delegation going out to meet a king, as he came into a city. And uh, we see other evidence of this in Scripture in Matthew chapter 25. We see the parable that Jesus told about the bridesmaids. They went out to come back in with the bridegroom. And so um, that's the post-tribulation rapture. And then there is the view of the pre-wrath rapture. That is that the church will enter the tribulation, but will be raptured before the beginning of of the day of the Lord. It is immediately followed by the wrath of God associated with the sixth seal of Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 12. So uh, these are the differing views uh, that you'll find on the, the, the second coming and the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, the mid-tribulation rapture, the post-tribulation rapture, and then the uh, pre-wrath rapture. And then some of those see the rapture and the second coming as a simultaneous event. Others see them as being separated by a time of tribulation like, like is described in the book of Revelation. Well, I hope this is helpful, and I hope you'll join us on Sundays at Stillwater's Church. You're going to find, as we go through the book of Revelation, that you're going to be blessed God promised to bless every person that read it, that heard it, and kept it at the center of their focus. And the idea there is keeping Jesus at the center and the gospel at the center of your life. Well, God bless you. I love you. And I hope you have a great day. And I hope to see you this Sunday.